Good morning. If you want to turn in your Bibles with me or read it up on the screen, you can. I'm reading from Isaiah 6, 1 through 10. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go, and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their eyes heavy, and blind, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. All right. Well, I'm wearing a mask this morning because it's not COVID. Uh, I have about a monthly bout during the spring with sinus infections, and so uh, this, is, this is one of those times, and uh, praise the Lord we're here. So uh, we're going to continue. Uh, open uh, your copy of God's Word with me to Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4. Before we begin, I just want to make you aware that it is uh, Teacher Appreciation Sunday. And so we, uh, we, we want to thank the teachers in our, in our kids' ministry. Uh, so you're involved as a teacher of Sunday school, a teacher in the nursery. I'm going to get out the list here because I just... A teacher assistant, a Bible adventure teacher, a one-on-one buddy for the special needs uh, a nursery uh, uh, volunteer, greeters, check-in, prayer team, if you're involved in junction, or if you're just admin support, uh, helping Angela with the odds and hands. I want you to stand up. Let's, let's just see what we... Yes, there we go. Thank you all so much for sewing... Uh, the seed of God's words in the heart of our children. Well, turn with me to Mark 4. The Spirit of Jesus says, Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no grain. And the other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was done, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, Everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, 
Do you not understand this parable? How then would you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the, the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while then. When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown along uh, among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for giving us your word. Father, I pray for my voice. I pray that it endures uh, these next 30, 40 minutes. Uh, Father, I pray that your word is clear. I pray, Lord, that they don't hear a cracking voice and a feeble man, but that they hear the voice of your son. Uh, Father, may we listen to your word, and may we become a fruitful people. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, early on in my Christian walk, I, I, I experienced some confusion about what successful evangelism was. You see, let's, let's, let's get our definitions uh, right, right off. Uh, successful evangelism is biblical evangelism. And biblical evangelism is a presentation, a faithful presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and an offer to receive him. That's evangelism. That's biblical evangelism. Evangelism is not coercion. It is not a personal testimony. It is not social justice or political action. It is not apologetics or or, or the defense of the faith. It is not the results of evangelism either. Successful evangelism is just a faithful presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you do that, you're a successful evangelist. Well, I had been confusing that, what successful evangelism is, with the results of evangelism. And so I thought, well, I I need to know my stuff. And so I studied philosophy. I studied theology. I studied apologetics, the defense of the the, the truth. I I studied those things committed myself to them like a madman, and, and, and when I thought, thought, thought that I was finally ready, an opportunity came up at a coffee shop when a college student uh, got in a conversation with me. And so I, uh, I presented to her what I thought was a compelling recounting the gospel. I listened to her objections respectfully, and I refuted her kindly. I refuted her attempts to discredit the Bible, And then I think I gave a winsome appeal rooted in facts and logic. But I was unprepared for her response, which was this. Well, I'm just suspicious of logical arguments because they can be used to oppress people. Well, today's text tells us that it's not a matter of having the right answers And it's not a matter of having the right methodology. It's not a matter of having the right program in your church. It's a question of the soil. Brothers and sisters and friends, how you respond to God's word is the most important and definitive thing about you. Period. That's it. That's what we see in this text Mark 4, 1 through 20, teaches us that the plan of God is that the word of God creates the fruitful people of God. And we'll see this in our text as it makes three emphatic points. And in verses 1 through 9, there's a repeated command to, one, listen to the word. 
listen to the word. Number one, and, and, and you must listen to the word of God. You must hear the word of God because as we see in verses 10 through 12, our second point is the word hardens the obstinate. Obstinate means those who refuse to listen. And, 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 and even as the word hardens the obstinate, point three in verses 13 through 20, the word creates a holy people. The word creates creates a holy people. So let's dive in. And we're going to listen to the word. Well, as Andy taught us last week, context is tremendously important in the book of Mark. The first three chapters of Mark, he's, he's establishing Jesus' authority, which is rooted in his divinity. And while Jesus uh, uh, chooses his 12 in chapter 3, the religious leaders come from Jerusalem and then they make a line-crossing, blasphemous accusation of where Jesus' authority really comes from. Because they cannot tolerate any other conclusion regarding his authority, and so they say, he's satanic. He's satanic. They've crossed the line there. And at the same time in that context, you see Jesus' immediate family struggling with Jesus' identity, struggling with Jesus' claims, and struggling with his authority. And so now, chapter 4, 1 through 20, you have Jesus and crowds. And, and, and this crowd is pressing in, and so Jesus gets into a boat and goes out onto the water. And this, this would form, it's a large crowd, this would form something like a, a natural amphitheater. Your voice would bounce off the water and project well, and so Jesus is out on the water, and so everyone there can hear him preaching the word. And the context of Mark is so important here. Jesus teaches in parables. Well, what, what, what's going on here? Well, the context, again, is important because the Spirit of God is telling us through the pen of Mark that the people of God are not created by family identity. They are not created by fake piety. And they are not created by ethnic identity. God's people are created by God's word. They always have been. Throughout all of history, from, from when God created mankind, he creates people by the words of his mouth, and so it is his word creates his people. Throughout the scriptures, the question of the matter for every single character is how they respond to God's word. That is what defines Adam. That is what defines Eve. That is what defines Noah. That is what defines Abraham, Shifra, Pua, Moses, Pharaoh, Joshua, Saul, David, and an endless list of kings, or actually an ended list of kings, following every single one defined by their response to God's word. So I'll say it again. How you respond to God's word is the most important thing about you. Now, brothers and sisters, it's, it's common in our day, and you'll even hear this from Christians, to accuse other Christians, to accuse Christians who take the Bible seriously of something they call bibliolatry. Has anyone ever heard that term thrown around? Bibliolatry. They're saying, oh, you, you worship the Bible, not God. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. God is inseparable from his word. God's character is bound up in his word. I can remember back in seminary, a lot of us were gathered for a get-together, a lot of the students, and, and we were having a good time talking, and then Philip... Uh, my friend Philip, not well, not my friend, you'll find out. Uh, Philip stood up and he said, hey, it's late. I don't have the car. The wife has the car. Can anyone drive me home? And I stood up and said, Philip, I'll drive you home. And Philip responded by standing back up and saying, hey, it's late. I don't have a car. I need a ride. Can anyone give me a ride home? And I said, Philip, I really have a car. 
It's right there. I'll drive you home right now. And Philip said, anybody, does anybody have a car? What was Philip saying about me by the way he treated my word? In Philip's defense, I was, and in Philip's defense, I was kind of a, a jerk back then. So, um, uh, <clears throat> but what was he saying? He was disrespecting me. So it is with God's word. If you reject God's word, you reject God. You reject Christ. That's the point of this story. Jesus teaches the crowd what is often called the parable of the sower here. Now, that's what it's called in Matthew. Jesus himself says that in Matthew. Listen here now to what the parable of the sower means. But you can also call it the parable of the soils. Uh, why? Because it's, it's clearly spoken to people for a response. It's spoken to people there telling them that they are soils. That they are, there's four types of soils, and really what we'll find is there's really two types of soils, ultimately. And so that, that, that's what it's about. Let's look at verses 3 through 9. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we see these four types of soil, but... As Andy talked last week, Mark likes to sandwich things, doesn't he? And he sandwiches the parable with commands to listen. Listen, hear. Listen is a key command in Scripture. We see that in the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. It says, hear, O Israel. And then in Deuteronomy 18, when Jesus foretold of Jesus' coming... Uh, when Moses foretold that Jesus is coming, he said in verses 18 through 19, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. And when Peter retells the same thing in Acts 3, he says, Anyone who does not listen to my words will be cut off from the people. But more than this, we see this refrain repeated in Mark 9 when Jesus is transfigured. God the Father speaks from heaven, and he says this in Mark 9, 6. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. See, Jesus isn't just the great prophet. Jesus isn't just the one who has been given the word of God. Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus is the word made flesh. His word and his person are inseparable. If you reject the word, you reject Christ. And if you reject Christ, you reject the scriptures. This is what Jesus is constantly telling the Pharisees. They're one in the same. They are one in the same. So friends, you cannot say that you love Jesus, but you just don't like the Old Testament. You cannot say that you love Jesus, but you really don't like that guy, Paul. You can't do it. It is his word. It is for us. It has been given to us graciously. We must receive it. We must hear. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as our fathers did in the wilderness. Listen 
to him. Listen to him. We should listen to him because, number two, the word hardens the obstinate. The word hardens the obstinate. Mark 4, 1 through 20 is itself a Mark and Sandwich, as Andy mentioned. Really, the entire book is just filled with them. We've been covering a lot of Mark and Sandwiches, and we just haven't pointed them out yet. But, but Mark 4, 1 through 20 is just such an obvious sandwich. Um, and, and, and that means verses 10 through 12, it's the center of the sandwich. It's that meat of the sandwich. And, and what that means is that it holds the meaning of the larger section. And if you have an ESV, like I do up here, what it says is a subheading right above 10 through 12 there is the purpose of the parables. Oh, so right there in the middle, Mark is telling us why Jesus spoke in parables. Let's read 10 through 12 there. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything for, for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. The purpose of the parables is to obscure. It's to harden. It's to confuse those who reject Jesus. But to those who receive him, he explains his teaching to them fully. That's what happens right there in that text. But, but, but why would Jesus do that? I mean, that doesn't make sense, right? Do you, I mean, is Jesus reading the church growth books? I mean, if it, if, if it was me with this, uh, this college student there, and, and it was, she was confused, and, oh, let me, let me try to clarify. Let me take a, a second crack at it. Let me, let me get really particular with you here. But not Jesus. Why? Why? Well, Jesus had already been demonstrating his authority and, and, and showing miracles, and then he makes these grand claims. After he told them that he was the Lord of the Sabbath, the Pharisees then began to plot to destroy Jesus. And in fact, it, it's in 323, in the context of those blasphemous accusations toward Jesus, that, it's, that, that the first time Mark mentions parables. Their hearts are hard, and Jesus speaks in parables to them to harden them further. Jesus has been rejected as the Word. And so now the Word will harden the obstinate. Jesus paraphrases Isaiah 6, 9 through 10 here. We can, we can pull that up on the screen. That, that'd be great. Uh, he, uh, Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. Connie read that at the beginning of service. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Well, Jesus gives a paraphrase of that because it it's not identical to that in the passage. But he, he cuts out a lot of 10, and then he leaves in the last line of 10 there, and instead of the word healed, he uses the word forgiven. Forgiven. Why? Why? Well, because he's tying it to his earlier pronouncement. Context is so important in Mark. Where the one who commits blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not have forgiveness. They will not be forgiven. So why would God harden these people? Why on earth? Well, much like how God hardened Pharaoh's heart to, 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 shower, to shower his glory, his mercy, his kindness upon his people, 
and this great rescue of them in the Exodus. Just like that, he here partially hardens a portion of the Jews so that in their hardness of heart, they would crucify the Son of God. And, and in so doing, they would bring about the deliverance of his people out of their slavery to sin. If you will, Jesus is the new Moses leading people out of exodus of sin slavery into the promised land, the, the kingdom. That's what's he, what he's doing. And in hardening the heart, just like hardening Pharaoh's heart, he is causing his very crucifixion, which will bring about uh, the deliverance of many sons to glory. Look how much the Father loves you. Look at what, look at what he's done for you. What, what has he withheld from you? That he planned it and that he walked willingly to the cross, even in his teaching, that he might take on your sin and my sin and so purchase for himself a precious people. This is the work of the Lord. This is the work of the Lord for you. So the parables are in fact functioning a lot like the cloud in Exodus. What does the cloud do? It gives light to Israel and it gives confusion and darkness to Egypt. That's what's going on. That's what's going on. The word hardens the obstinate not just back then and there, but, but here and now. Here and now. Brothers and sisters, as the culture around us attempts to, to cast off restraint and to, to, to grow in their spite for the word of God, it is so clear that God's purpose in this is that he would make his people even more distinct. Even more like Christ. Shining like, like stars in the universe. That we would suffer like him. Because the father's attracted. The father loves his son, is drawn toward his son, is compelled toward his son. And so, brothers and sisters, endure. Endure. We are becoming a more distinct people. And that means this, if you love Jesus, if you truly love Jesus, if you truly love his word, you're going to be a little weird. Well, that's okay. I, I, Port, Port, Portland claims to love weird, right? Keep Portland weird. Keep Christianity weird. That was kitschy. We need to be a weird people. We need to be a weird people. Do you stand out from the world? Do you, do you look weird? Do you look odd? Because the word is shaping a distinct people. I had a dear friend in, in college, and we stayed friends. I stood in his wedding. I preached his wedding. Um, his name was Caleb. Caleb was brilliant. Memorized multiple books of the Bible. He was an anesthesiologist. And that's what he became. He was brilliant. And he would go on weekends to, instead of having a good time or anything, he would go to the UVA, the UVA campus there, and he would preach the gospel. And then he would, he would fly in his summers down to Mexico or to whatever country he had on a whim, and he would walk the country, and he would preach the gospel. This was Caleb. And we kept in touch through the years. And six years ago, I get a phone call from Caleb, and he tells me, Asa, I'm not a Christian anymore. Rattled me to my core. Brothers and sisters, we should not be rattled by apostasy. This very text tells us it will happen. So when you read about Josh Harris, when you read about uh, uh, guys like that, uh, Derek Webb, guys apostatizing, blaspheming, don't be shaken. Jesus promised us that this would happen. And so when my friend Caleb, he, he continues to call me. 
And I just notice the more he calls me, the more different we are every time. Sometimes he'll be drunk. Sometimes he'll be cursing. Sometimes he'll say all sorts of profane things, and I'm, I'm utterly not like that. Last year, he gave me a call, and he said, hey, I'm having another kid. Do you have advice for me? And I said, Caleb, I have no advice for you. I have no advice for you because my life is wrapped around Jesus Christ, and you reject him, and you hate him. So what can I say that would be compelling to you or be received by you? I can't. We're different. God's word creates a distinct people. And that's what we should be. But more than this, how, how, how often have we seen that, that hardness or persecution in one people group actually means and leads to the, the, the spread of the gospel in another people group? That happens all the time. That happens throughout church history. The gospel doesn't get inroads in one way, and they say, okay, fine, we'll, we'll go plant a church. Well, North Korea has grown hard and isolated. South Korea has the largest churches in the world. South Korea is sending missionaries all over the world. God is doing his work. God is doing his work. Isaiah tells us as much in another sermon of the sower in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. Let's look that up. I should have it there. I'll turn there. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Whenever you share the word of Christ with someone and they reject it, do not think for a second that God did not accomplish his purposes with it. Do not think for a second that that word is powerless. It is not. If it hardens... It has no regard for your eloquence or for your intellect or for your boldness. But if it is upon good soil that it, fa it falls, it does not matter how weak or how unprepared or how unpolished it is, God will save and he will save by his word. It springs forth into life. I can remember in, in, in high school I had a guitar teacher and every week I would I'd bring my Christian music. Teach me this Christian song. Teach me this Christian song. And he'd ask me what it means and I would try to get to the gospel and he'd, he'd see where I was going a mile away and he'd like cut me. Oh, that's great. You know, okay, we're done and, and, and move on to something else. And so I tried that every week. And eventually I just stopped taking guitar lessons. But the time came when I was, I was headed to college. I was packing up my car and I had to go to Walmart for one more thing. So I go to Walmart, and I'm standing in the checkout line, and I hear, Asa. And lo and behold, it's Austin, my guitar teacher, and he runs up to me, and he says, I, I, I just want you to know that I've become a Christian. I, I, I heard what you were saying. I've become a Christian. My presentations were so weak. They were so partial. But God used it. God used it. God will save, and he will save, not by our wisdom, not by our strength, not by our argumentation skills. He will save by his word, Jesus Christ. And therein is our third point. Number three, the word creates a holy people. Jesus speaks plainly to his people, and he still does today. Uh, whenever you're in the text and you feel, feel, feel burning of conviction in your heart, that's the spirit of Jesus calling you to forsake sin and to turn toward him in trust and repentance. And that is the life of a Christian. The theologians call this illumination. The Holy Spirit imparts the words of Jesus to your heart and it convicts you as though Jesus is standing there next to you and talking to you. This is why we preach the word. This is why we center the sermon around the, 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 the service around the word of God. Because that's where Jesus is present with his people. 
Christ is the word, and he comes to us in the preaching of the word, in the reading of the word, in the hearing of the word. In Ephesians 2.17, Paul tells the Ephesians that Christ came and preached to them. Well, tell me, when in the Gospels do you see Jesus going to Ephesians, or to, 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 to Ephesus? You don't. You don't. He never went there in person. Christ approaches his people in and through the word of God. This is very clear. But in our text, Jesus speaks clearly to his own. He tells them what the meaning of the parable is. We see the different types of soil. The, 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 the hard path is where Satan snatches it away. The rocky soil is where tribulations and trials wither the root and it, 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 it dies. And then the thorns is where the cares of this world, the love for money and for things and for stuff, chokes out the word. So there's those first three. They all reject Christ. They're all in that category. But then the good soil. The good soil produces what James calls a harvest of righteousness. And it's so cool that James says that for this text because the context in 321, Jesus is, James is there with his family calling Jesus crazy. He's calling Jesus crazy in 321 there. In other words, James changed. James was the hard soil and James became the good soil. And so that means that if you are hearing the word preached right now, and you are, the story hasn't yet ended for you. Just like James, if you have rejected the word in the past, you can receive it now. Do you feel the burning of the Spirit convicting your conscience? That is Jesus saying, you need me. You need forgiveness. You can only have life in me. So repent, receive him. Do not harden your hearts as our fathers did in the wilderness. But this good soil produces a harvest of righteousness. God's word creates a fruitful people. Those who receive Christ bring forth fruit. And that is the character of Christ. Jesus not only died to atone for our sins, but through his death and resurrection, he purchased our righteous life. This is why God's people become holy. If you embrace Jesus, the word of God, the son of God, you cannot hold on to the sins of your past. You can't do it. If you receive the word, you will bear fruit. There is no such thing as a fruitless Christian. And I say that and I will get people, oh wait, what about deathbed conversions? Oh wait, what about the thief on the cross? Well, friends, repentance is a fruit. They had fruit. And if they lived longer, they would have more fruit. And so I'm not delegitimizing deathbed conversions. There's fruit there. And that's what I want to see in every Christian's life is repentance when the word of God encounters them and Jesus speaks through it and convicts you. We must repent. That's the way we receive the word. That's the way we receive it. <laughs> Which soil best describes you? Remember James changed and you can change too. Are, are you the hardened path? Well, God is not a dog begging for your attention, as though you can throw him a, a bone of, of church attendance or, or, or good deeds or charity. Repent, believe. How, how do you respond to the gracious word of his son? Have the cares of this world have choked your, out your affections for him? Repent. Repent. 
Have you placed so much emotional energy in, 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 in things that are of second importance compared to his word? Repent. What does your response to the word look like? Are you in the word? Are you longing for and craving for the word? Because a Christian longs for Jesus. The central point of the matter is Christ. So how do you respond to his word? I want us to think on that. We're entering a time of communion. And I I want us just to be silent for a minute to reflect, what kind of soil am I? The table, the Lord's Supper, is for those who have repented and placed their faith and trust in Jesus. And so, I want you to take a minute and and ask, what soil am I? Am I in Christ? And if you're not, repent. Repent and believe and partake of this table. Let's also be examining ourselves. How do I respond to the word? Because that's the essential heart of the matter. That's the most important thing about you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your strong word. We thank you that he took on flesh. We thank you that he died for our sins, that he rose from the dead. We thank you that he's speaking today through his word. May we be molded into his image. We pray this in the strong name of the word, Jesus. Amen.